Okay, so you saw the title, there's no need to stall for time. Let's get right into the meat of the video, and boy do I have a graph to show you. Now, in order to find who won the hardest Super Bowl of all time, including the entire playoff run that that team had to go through, I need to introduce you to the SRS statistic. Basically, the SRS stat takes into account a team's total point differential and strength of schedule, producing a number that roughly determines how good a team is. Now, in order to find how tough a team's road to a Super Bowl is, you can add up all opponents' SRS scores and then divide that by the number of games played, and you get the SRS score determining how hard a team's playoff schedule actually is. And I don't know why, but this fascinated me. So I decided to calculate every single Super Bowl champion's SRS score to find who had the hardest road to a Lombardi. And man, this took me way longer than it should have, but this is the final list of every single Super Bowl winner's SRS score since the merger. I calculated the average score is also 5.92, so anything above that number is considered a harder road to a Super Bowl than average, and anything under is easier. And immediately, a ton of things stick out to me. I mean, you got both of the Giants Super Bowl rings under Eli Manning ranked in the top 10, and you even have the Patriots Dynasty teams just scattered everywhere in the graph. I mean, you got one at 5, one at 9, 12, 22, 42, and their comeback against the Atlanta Falcons ranking in at their easiest Super Bowl win at 45th. You got the 1985 Bears, arguably the best team of all time, ranking at 43, the 1996 and 97 season having the same SRS score, and so much more. So feel free to pause the video and take a deeper look at this crazy graphic. But for this video, I wanted to focus on the top of the top. Which teams had to bleed the most and battle the best of the best to acquire their Super Bowl rings? So let's put a magnifying glass onto the top four teams. The only four teams that had to face against an SRS score of nine or more. And after we go through each of these teams, maybe this will help you to decide once and for all which NFL team won the hardest Super Bowl ever. Now let's start at number 4, the 1998 Broncos, and they were an all-time great team. So great that they had just won the Super Bowl the year prior with John Elway and were prepared to crawl over broken glass for a chance at another Lombardi. And like I said, this Broncos team was nothing short of dominant, as they were second in the league in scoring and had the most rushing touchdowns in the entire league with 26. And the Broncos defense was pretty solid, they were 11th overall in yards, and even better, 3rd in the league in rushing yards allowed, but they did have a weak spot in the passing game, ranking in at 26 in the league against the pass, allowing 248.94 yards per game through the air. But the Broncos had something that other teams just didn't have, and that was the criminally underrated Terrell Davis, who arguably had the greatest season a running back has ever had in 1998. Behind an amazing O-line, Terrell Davis put some mediocre statistics up as he racked up 392 carries for just 2,008 yards, 23 touchdowns, made the Pro Bowl, won Offensive Player of the Year, and won the MVP of the league. You know, just like prime Rex Burkhead numbers. So the Broncos rode Terrell Davis to a 14 win season, only losing two games all year long, and this is where the treacherous quest to a Super Bowl would begin. As in the divisional round, the Broncos would face off against, oh, you know, just a Hall of Fame coach in Jimmy Johnson, a Hall of Fame quarterback in Dan Marino, and a Hall of Fame center in Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, yes, and the number one defense in the entire NFL in the Miami Dolphins. I'm not even joking, the Dolphins' starting running back was literally named Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Anyway, the scariest thing about this Dolphins team was the fact that they were one of only two teams that beat the Broncos this year, as they handed Denver a steaming 31-21 loss earlier this year. So, I mean, it only made sense that an old and bruised Broncos team would struggle against a team that had already gotten their number earlier this year. Uh... Well, after single-handedly endangering a specific marine mammal, next in line on the Broncos' gauntlet was the 12-4 New York Jets. 
So after just playing the best defense in the NFL, the Broncos got a break by now having to face against the second best defense in the NFL. And it also didn't exactly help that the Jets were being led by a Hall of Fame coach in Bill Parcells and a high-powered offense led by a Pro Bowl trio of Vinny Testaverde, Curtis Martin, and Keyshawn Johnson. And as the game began, for three quarters it was all Jets, as they took a 10-0 lead on the best first half offense in football. Well, uh, that didn't last long, as the Broncos defense smothered the Jets offense all game, only allowing a one-yard touchdown after a punt block, and finally John Elway led a Broncos onslaught in the second half, scoring 20 points in the third quarter to bury the Jets 23-10, advancing to the Super Bowl. Now finally, after beating the two toughest opponents they could have possibly faced, the Broncos caught a break, as the Vikings, uh... You know, anyway, after a fiasco of a meltdown, the 15-1 Vikings, with the highest SRS score in the league by a mile with 14.89, were eliminated by, uh, Chris Chandler. So the team waiting for them was the Atlanta Falcons, who were no pushover as they flaunted a 14-2 record of their own with an SRS score of 9.98, one higher than the Broncos themselves. But nobody really was giving the Falcons a chance against the defending Super Bowl champions, not Vegas, who had the Broncos as 7.5 point favorites, not Mike Shanahan, the coach of the Broncos, who before the game told his players that if you don't beat this team by 50 points, you should be embarrassed. And damn, that's just downright disrespectful. But it also didn't help that before the Super Bowl, the Falcons' best defensive player was busted for trying to hire a prostitute who turned out to be an undercover cop. And also, their cornerback Ray Buchanan attempted to sell his soul, as Joe Namath once did, as he guaranteed a victory over Denver. But that's all before the game, and as the game went underway, things went awfully for Atlanta, as the Broncos drove right down the field and scored easily, but paid a price, losing their Hall of Fame tight end Shannon Sharp in the process. But it turned out, a blood sacrifice was all that was needed to guarantee victory, as after John Elway miraculously hobbled into the end zone, the Broncos held a 31-6 lead in the fourth quarter, effectively impaling all chances at an Atlanta comeback. Uh, yeah, I guess insert 28-3 joke here, and the Broncos had completed the two-peat and statistically speaking, the fourth hardest Super Bowl road to victory ever. Alright, we move up the graph, and, you know, look, I'd love nothing more than to talk in detail about the 2007 Giants. I mean, with context, this team is probably the most improbable Super Bowl champion ever, but I've already talked about this team time and time again, and their SRS score is juiced a lot, because they beat, statistically speaking, the best team ever. I mean, just look at this. This is a joke. A 20.06 SRS score for the 2007 Patriots, and they lost to Eli Manning in the su- I- Sorry. Anyway, let's move straight to number two on the graph, and a team that you probably remember, the 2013 Seattle Seahawks. Sorry, let me be selfish here for a second. After looking back on this team, I forgot how much I personally loved them. Russell Wilson, Marshawn Lynch, Doug Baldwin, Bobby Wagner, Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, Richard Sherman, Michael Bennett, and so many more Pro Bowl Hall of Fame level players. And right as the season began, the Seahawks were ready to get those stars rolling, as right out of the gate, they felt disrespected, because almost everyone was heavily sleeping on them in preseason power rankings. So what do you do? Well, you go start a fight with the toughest guy that there is, as they had a prime chance to do exactly Exactly that against the Super Bowl attendee 49ers in week two and embarrassed them on national TV with a 29-3 shellacking. 
And this was only the beginning, as by all metrics, the Seahawks had the best defense in the entire NFL and one of the best of all time. Specifically, their secondary was nothing short of legendary, only giving up 16 touchdowns through the air all year while also leading the league in interceptions by a mile with 28. So the Seahawks coasted through the year with a 13-3 record, losing their three games by a combined 15 points. So in the first round of the playoffs, in the divisional round, the Seahawks faced off against the Saints, stouting arguably the best quarterback in the league in Drew Brees, as well as the best tight end in the league in Jimmy Graham, and an all-time great offense that came in at second in both passing yards and touchdowns. So this team, going 11-5, with an SRS score of 8.77 and a legendary offense with a prime Drew Brees, got absolutely extinguished, going scoreless in three quarters and losing the game in embarrassing fashion. Marshawn Lynch ran all over them, and Drew Brees' eternal torment at the hands of Seattle in the playoffs continued. But for Seattle, this was merely their genesis, as little did the Seahawks know that they would be competing in one of the most intense NFC Championship games of all time. As waiting for the Seahawks was their biggest rival, the 49ers, who went 12-4 on the year, had an SRS score of 10.14, and for all intents and purposes, was their best matchup in the league. Now, the Seahawks had a one-game lead on the 49ers, and because of this, they were able to secure home field advantage in this game, which, in the 49ers' case, would prove to be lethal. But hold on, it didn't look like that early on, as Colin Kaepernick and the 49ers' offense poked some holes in this iron suit that was the Seattle Seahawks' defense, taking a 10-0 lead in the second quarter. But everything changed in Seattle's favor, as with their back against the wall down by four points, the Seahawks coach Pete Carroll showed some massive balls by going for it on a fourth and seven and converting with a 35-yard touchdown to Jermaine Curse on an offsides penalty. The Seahawks then hung on after arguably the most clutch defensive play ever as Richard Sherman tips the 49ers' last chance at victory into the hands of Malcolm Smith, punching their ticket to the Super Bowl. Whew, so this Seahawks team crawled, and I mean crawled, into the Super Bowl with mortal wounds all over them, and guess who was waiting there? Well, you know, just the best offensive team in NFL history. The Denver Broncos, led by MVP quarterback Peyton Manning, who threw 55 touchdowns to only 10 interceptions, broke the passing record throwing for 5,477 yards, leading the team to set an NFL record scoring 606 points on the season. So this Broncos team that went 13-3 had an SRS score of 11.37 and all of the aforementioned greatness on offense went into the Super Bowl with a very clear narrative behind them. Who would prevail? The greatest offense of the decade or the greatest defense of the decade? Everyone, and I mean everyone, was ready to watch the potential best Super Bowl of all time, as the two best teams of the decade would duke it out in a battle of all-time greatness to measure... It's snapped over the head of Peyton Manning. A flag is down, and the ball's out of the back of the end zone. And just like that, the game was over. The Seattle Seahawks obliterated and embarrassed the best offense in NFL history like they were a goddamn middle school Pop Warner team. All game long, the Legion of Boom dominated Peyton Manning while the offense did their job capping off the Seahawks' first ever Super Bowl and statistically the second hardest Super Bowl journey of all time. But somehow that wasn't enough for number one. And, okay, seriously, the 1976 Raiders? And look, I'll be the first to admit, before doing research for this video, I thought I had done some miscalculating for sure. But after double and triple checking my calculations and doing even more research, um, yeah, let's just say I did my math correctly. 
So, time for a history lesson, because I got my money on the 1976 Raiders being the most underrated NFL team of all time. I mean, this Raiders team is just the anomaly of all anomalies, as although they had an incredible record of 13-1, led by Hall of Fame coach John Madden, and were loaded with seven Hall of Famers on the team across both sides of the ball, they only had an SRS score of 8.52, and each and every team they would face in the playoffs would statistically be much better than they were. And this Raiders team followed a path very similar to the 98 Broncos, as after pillaging through the regular season with only one singular loss, they would have to face their demons right away, as in the divisional round, they would face the Patriots, the only team to beat them in the regular season and they were fully prepared to spoil the Raiders' season. And you know, this ragtag Patriots team could have done it, as they went 11-3 in the season, had an SRS score of 8.65, and more importantly, in the fourth quarter held a 21-10 lead over the Raiders. But the Raiders battled back, as led by Hall of Fame quarterback Ken Stabler, he erupted a ferocious comeback, scoring a touchdown to cut the game within one score. And after getting the ball back, on the last drive of the game, when it looked like all hope was lost, they were thrown a lifeline with an interesting roughing the passer call, where the Patriots may have hit Ken Stabler in the head, but they may not have, and the Raiders took advantage, going straight for the kill, finishing off the Patriots. So, after a first playoff game that could not have had more drama, they now had to face off against their boogeyman in the Pittsburgh Steelers, the team that had beaten the Raiders in the past two AFC championships. And of course, this Steelers team was stacked beyond belief, as they went 10-4 in the season and had a bloated SRS score of 15.34, first in the league by a country mile. Hall of Famers at literally every single position, including the coach, the best defense in the league with the steel curtain, and in this game, they got socked straight in the mouth. The Raiders played a perfect game. Ken Stabler went 10 of 16 for 88 yards and two touchdowns as they ran the ball 48 times on the ground. So the Raiders won this game, and now that they had just taken down arguably the most dominant dynasty in NFL history, they moved on to the Super Bowl to play against... Uh, the, the most tortured team in NFL lore. The Minnesota Vikings would be waiting, and this team, although not very intimidating, was nothing to look past. They donned an 11-2-1 record, an SRS score of 9.35, and were oozing with talent. They had arguably the most underrated quarterback of all time, with Hall of Famer Fran Tarkenton and other pro bowlers on offense, and a defense led by former MVP Alan Page, Hall of Famers and pro bowlers everywhere, as well as other remaining veterans of the vaunted Purple People Eater defense. So going into this game, experts predicted it to be a future classic, with two battle-tested teams duking it out to see who could possibly climb the ladder and win their franchise their first ever Super Bowl. Well, the Raiders came in with a plan. One very clear and obvious plan to run the football just as they did against the Steelers. And boy, did it work. As the Raiders ran the football straight down the gullet of the Purple People Eaters, grinding for 266 yards on 52 carries, converting two rushing touchdowns. So if it wasn't clear already, Vikings fans' dreams were pulverized instantly, as the Raiders at one point held a 26-7 lead late in the Super Bowl. And to put the final nail in the coffin of Minnesota that would never be opened again, Fran Tarkenton threw a 75-yard pick six to Willie Brown, who would then score on one of the most iconic plays in all of NFL lore, capping off by the numbers the hardest Super Bowl ever won, even 46 years later. So, what do you think? Although numbers never lie, they also clearly don't tell the full story. So, who do you think won the hardest Super Bowl ever? Comment your answer down below, because I honestly think there's some really good conversation to be had over this answer. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, then subscribe, because I got a lot of videos on the channel just like this one. And if you like this video, then watch this video right here on the worst NFL players from every single decade. It's pretty good, trust me. Anyways... <sighs> Until next time.